thank you, Jonathan and the band. They did a great job today. Am I right when I say that? Great. If you have your Bibles, open those book of Philippians chapter 4. My name is Chad Poe. Our sermon title for today is Muscle Memory. What does it mean for us to react to God in the way that he calls us to react? So, if you're a guest with us, uh, we have a very unique setup here at Ridgedale. And, and what I mean by that is we have two services that go on side by side. It's a pretty different, it's a different structure than most churches have. But, but here's what I love. that It's because we want to cast vision. And we believe that vision is what drives us. And while many churches are driven by vision and they're driven by one person, for whatever reason, God has allowed me to serve under Pastor Doug and to help to be part of that vision casting in this scenario. Now, let me say this. I was at a youth pastor's conference this week, and those are always weird. You, you get about 900 youth pastors together. I don't know what direction I'm supposed to go, like grow a goatee or buy a fanny pack. I don't know what needs to happen. But we're there together, and, and they're asking me what I do, because lots of them, for the last 15 years of my life, I've gotten to spend time with churches all across the, the southeast primarily and other portions of the country. And for the last 10 years, that's been really busy. And they're asking me, Chad, what are you doing? And I'm still traveling. I, I still travel a good bit. But when I would talk to them, I would say, I'm a teaching pastor at a church and they would begin to ask about what we do. And I would say, I'm a teaching pastor. They allow me to travel. They enable me to travel. And, well, what's your service like? Well, I would tell them it's really Mumfordy. We'll be honest. That's what it's like in here. But lots of Mumford and Sons sound insane. Some of you don't even know how it is. So, um, and then they would ask me other questions like, well, what kind of music do you like? And I would say, I don't care. I don't care. I, I don't care what we sing. I don't care how we sing. If, if we can... Get up here with a kazoo, I'm fine. Let's just make sure that we sing to Jesus and honor Jesus. It may be difficult to honor Jesus with a kazoo. I'm not sure. I don't care. And then they would say, well, well what's the dress like in there? And, I, and you can look around the room. I don't care. I don't care what you wear. Wear something. But I don't care what you look like. All that I want and my hope and my prayer for this and, and Pastor Doug's hope and prayer for this is that our church as a whole, regardless of what room you meet at, that we reach people. And, and if I'm being truthful with you, we, we've done a pretty poor job of that. There have been times for us where I've evaluated who we are and what we are and why we do what we do. And, and there have been times where you, as you look, you would see, yes, there, there are pockets of reach that take place, but as a whole, are we embracing the vision that God has given us from Scripture? So when, when Ryan stands on stage and he talks about the idea of discipleship and what it means for us to disciple, Here's what we have to realize. He is not a magic pixie that has shown up in this room and he's going to sprinkle dust on the youth ministry and those kids are going to be like, let's just be disciples. This is God placing him with us, for us, to help guide that. But if moms and dads miss their place in that, then we don't disciple. Together. And we make disciples as people Begin to evaluate us as a church, yet they look and they see that church, they're making disciples of the people that they have, they're, they're reaching the people that they have, and the reflection of that, the glow of God working in a congregation for the sake of discipleship begins to affect other people. And now, are, is everyone going to like it? Absolutely not. If everyone likes what you're doing, th then you're selling cotton candy. So we want to disciple people want to see people grow in relationship with Jesus. Now, there are opportunities that are coming that we'll share some about later for you to plug in and deepen your discipleship with this church. But here's the thing. This is a, a family thing. It's a unit thing. It's what we take. It's the idea of us realizing that sermon application is not what takes place when I wrap this thing up in a few minutes. Application is us realizing that that's just a watered-down way to talk about obedience. Are we being obedient to what God's called us to? Are we people who are obedient? Are we obedient to that in the lives of our children? Philippians chapter 4, beginning in um, verse 4. Let's read through this, and then I'm going to pray over us. I feel like I just backhanded you. I need to pray for you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will 
guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Lots of do's there, so we'll get to 10 through 13. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. Paul's in the claim here, by the way, that, that's prison. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secrets of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens. Let's pray together. If you'll do this, if you have a, a spouse with you, I would just ask you to maybe place your hands, hold hands as we pray. Pray for them, that God will use them in this. You may have not held hands in a couple of months, so let's work through that too. But let's pray together. God, you're good, and we thank you for today. And I pray that as we spend time in this passage, we see the strength you give us to do the things this passage leads us to do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love the Lord your God with all of your strength. So we go to the book of Deuteronomy where the original phrase comes from, the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and might. What is might in the language of the New Testament? The idea of loving God with your might is, is this. You are to love Him with your energies and your abilities. Why well, do we do that? The idea of strength is really popular. That's why that there are some people that the majority of people on the beach are drawn to in regards to eyes more than others. Uh, I was a wrestling fan when I was a kid. I, I'm, I'm not, this is not me supporting or affirming professional wrestling. You just know what happened. But it was the majority of my childhood. I really enjoyed watching wrestling. I, I liked that these men would growl at each other in their underwear. I didn't know what was happening there. I watched every single week. I would watch every time it would come on. That's on video, by the way. And I uh, so wrestling was a big part of my childhood. Uh, WrestleMania six, Hulk Hogan, the Ultimate Warrior, they had this battle in Toronto. Hulk Hogan was unbeatable. Well, he was beaten. I won't let you know that I teared up, but I teared up. Uh, there were other shows that I would watch that I really enjoyed. Uh, one of those was the television show, The American Gladiators. There was a revival in 2008. Does anyone remember The American Gladiators? Let's just be honest. I've got some hands that aren't up in the room that are telling me fib, but that's okay. So American Gladiators, I can remember their names like Nitro and Zap. Uh, it, it was Turbo. It was Malibu. There was a man named Malibu on this show. And I would watch that every week. Then there's this crew that shows up, and they're pretty much like a Christian version of the American Gladiators. They're called the Power Team. And I'm not going to knock anything. That, well, I'm going to knock it a little bit. But the power team, they would do really interesting things. So they would come to a church like this, and they would, they would have a rally, and uh, this large, large man would stand on stage with like shoulder muscles the size of me, and he would begin to grunt at the crowd in the way the professional wrestler would. Or, and near, here are the things that they would do. They would take a phone book, and they would rip it in half. Kids, a phone book is this book they used to give us. <laughs> so that you could get in touch with other people. We opened it. We pushed numbers. The power team got more creative. and They started doing this stuff where they would climb to the top of ladders. And they would jump off the ladder, and somehow they incorporated muscular ninjas into the act, and they would do this karate chop through about 15 layers of ice, and you're just watching that, thinking, oh, what? That just happened for real. Put that in my cola. So that's what happened. And, and they would do other things like grow rat tails, which we've tried to block out, but all of them had rat tails. If you don't know what a rat tail is, consider yourself better off. <laughs> the 
and they would stand up every week, and, and, and here was the verse that they would use. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And I would hear that. And I don't know, you've not seen pictures of me during my childhood because I hide them. But that was pretty much me same shape, about a foot and a half shorter. So I would get home, and Jesus was going to give me the strength to tear a phone book in half, and, and the phone book wouldn't tear. I would get the J.C. Penney catalog, but it was thinner, and it wouldn't tear either. Go to a Sports Illustrated, I'd rip that booger wide open. <laughs> and then ice, I couldn't do anything. I would just put crack the eyes on them put it in a bowl for my family. So I never grew a rat tail. I did do this thing with shaved sides. Never mind. So I I would hear that I could do all things through Jesus who gives me strength, but when I would stand up and I was like, going to do the things that they, God was evidently giving them strength to do, strength and protein shakes, I couldn't do those things. So I, re, I think through that, I begin... Is that what this passage is really about? Me tearing a phone book in half? Is this passage about me breaking eyes? Or, or someone swinging up? They would let each other, they would hit one another with bats. And the bat would break. Is that what this verse is about? I can do all things through Jesus who gives me strength. No. It's not. Now, I'm not going to, they've done some ministry and people have given their lives to Jesus. I pray that they've, gotten better theological training as they move forward? This isn't about us tearing stuff up. It's not about us seeing how far we can throw chairs. It's not about what you can do in a weight room. This is about something else, altogether different. Philippians 4, you can see that Paul is in prison in verses 10 through 13. We know that he's in prison. We believe that he's in Rome. Jim Price may disagree with me in the back of the room, but most believe that he's shaking his head. No, I agree with you completely, Chad. That, that's like preach, brother. So um, He's in Rome, in a Roman prison. We know that for a couple of reasons. One is he can have visitors. Actually, this whole story is about a visitor showing up to him. And they've given him money to take care of his needs while he's in prison. We also know that he, he's in Rome because he makes reference to Caesar's household. He references his execution, which is a Roman. And he says that he can do all things through Jesus who gives him strength in verse 13. He can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul's not about to rip a phone book in half. He's not going to break any eyes. And based on those felt men we slept, slapped on Sunday school boards when I was a kid, he didn't have a rat tail. His hair was too balding for that. What he's saying is that in the midst of where I am, I can do all things through Jesus. So loving God with your strength is, is not about what you can muster up from within. It's about God, his outside source, Jesus, coming, you meeting the Messiah, and that changing you. That changes your strength. That changes the way you exhibit strength. That, that, that changes how you see what you're going to walk through. So if, if your marriage is difficult right now, that's not saying give up. That's saying in all things, you can, you can do all things through Jesus who gives you strength. This is an endurance. Some of us who've lost loved ones that are struggling with how to get through this, God's saying to us in this passage, you can do this because I'm going to strengthen you to do this. Now, in your own ability, in your own power, you can. But you can do this. I'm, I'm with you. I want, I want to affirm you in that. So what all can Paul do in this passage? If he's going to do all things through Jesus, if, who gives him strength, are we saying that he's going to do destructive things that we've tried to forget? No. Here's what we're saying. We have to go back to verse 4. Because Jesus gives me strength, here's what Paul would say to us. Because Jesus is my strength, I can rejoice in all things. So when the hardships come, because Jesus is my strength, outside source placed within me, I can do all things. I can, I can rejoice in this, in good and bad, in hard and not so hard. I can rejoice in these things because he's my strength. It, when we begin to consider what it means for him to give us strength, we, we would look at this passage and we would see that because Christ gives us our strength, when irrational things happen, anybody this week, 
something irrational happen for you. Raise the just need a hand. Need a hand. You can rationalize through that in a God honoring way because Jesus gives you strength. The passage talks about anxiety in verse six. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to the Lord. So this says if anxiety is something you struggle with, and, and some of us do, and, and this passage lets us know that God's not left you to deal with that on your own, but to remember that he's your strength as you face that and as you deal with that and as you walk through that. You can do all things through Jesus that gives you strength. And, and to consider these implications that Paul lays out where he says you do this with thanksgiving, what are we thankful for that we've got the strength to even walk through this right now? You can do all things through Jesus share, he then continues to let us know the things that he can do because Jesus is his strength. He, he shares his needs with the Lord because Jesus is his strength. He, he chooses to honor. This passage actually says this as you read. And finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything in excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. You can do this because Jesus gives you strength as a believer. So what's this passage telling us? That when we realize the strength we have through the power of God's Spirit that we sang about a few moments ago, if I'm going to be really truthful with you today, I'm going to tell you this. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength, which means that we can do the things that we don't want to do. I don't want to rejoice in all things. When bad things happen, I want to sit in the corner of my room and I want my children to sit in the far other corner of the home and I want to sulk. And Jesus says, no, you can rejoice because I'm with you. And when I don't want to be rational, I would rather be irrational about situations. Jesus says, because I'm your strength, you have been given sound mind because of me to deal with what you're dealing with right now. So do all things through me because I'm your strength. You're not your strength. When I deal with anxiety, and I deal with anxiety, Jesus reminds me that with Thanksgiving, I'm to view that and to treat that and, and to handle that. And I'm to, to, with a sound mind, because Jesus is my strength, ask for help when I need help. Do all things through Jesus who gives you strength. He's your strength. You're not. So if in our mind we think we can, we can muster this up, we can make this work on our own, then Jesus, absolutely not. If you're trying to do this on your own, you can't. You choose honor and you choose excellence and you can choose things that are praiseworthy because Jesus is your strength. And outside of Him, you're not going to choose honor because it's much easier to choose dishonor. It's much easier to choose things that are not excellent, to settle for less. It's much easier to not praise things that are praiseworthy. You can do all things through Jesus who gives you strength. So, so that's a passage that gets really, really mistreated by people. And honestly, there are guys who've written books. If you want to go to any bookstore and look at the Christian section, let me be truthful with you. About 85% of it is self-help books, which is in complete opposite and denial of what this passage teaches. Self-help's not a biblical idea. As a matter of fact, if the biblical concept of self-help is self-helplessness. You can't do anything. But if we are in Jesus and we trust in Christ, and honestly, that phrase is littered throughout Scripture. In Jesus, in Jesus, in Jesus, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Over and over, we find that our strength is in Him. Not in you, not in me. It's outside of us, but it's God intersecting with our lives in such a way that our strength is there. From Him, it's not this ethereal thing. It's the idea of the Spirit of the Lord being alive in us and us considering with our minds what it means for the way that we live and the way that we treat one another to acknowledge that. Are you Acknowledging the strength that God has offered you in Jesus. Uh, here's what other passages 
tell us about this prince. Uh, we learn that the idea of us being strong in regards to what God teaches us in His Word, it's actually made perfect in weakness. So what's that mean? It means that you acknowledge that that, that, weakness, that lack of strength on your own. It means that you embrace the, the presence of God there. So you look at that Philippians passage, you see ideas highlighted in verse 7. You look at these later in light of the passage. You see the strength of God in verse 7. The peace of God is there, surpasses all understanding. It will guard your heart. So you want to be guarded by strong things. God's Spirit guards you. We look into to verse 13 there. Again, I can do all things through Jesus who gives me strength. These concepts are present. Verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, you can practice these things because the God of peace is with you. Those three concepts throughout Philippians 4, 7, 9, 13, affirming what we can do because Christ is our strength. Now, he's going to make his, his strength and his power perfect in our weakness. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to flip those to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to look at where Paul deals with a lack of strength. Just a little background here. There's a group of guys called the Super Apostles. And that's literally what how Paul refers to them. They're guys who think they have everything together. They have had visions from God and they stand before everyone that comes in contact with them and here's what they communicate with their life that everything's together, that we are strong in and of ourselves. We are so strong that God allowed us to see Him, which is false according to what Paul says. And I'm going to go with what Paul says because there's not an epistle written by super apostles. So you look at the passage and you, you begin to see what it means for them to, what it means for Paul to say where our strength comes from. Verse 7 of 2 Corinthians 12. So to keep me from becoming conceited, Paul literally has seen God. He has seen the three heavens, read through those few verses before this, and he says, I really got to see it, and to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh. Lots of arguments as to what that is. Some say migraine headaches. Some say a speech impediment. Regardless of what it is, it's a messenger of Satan. So I don't want to get all hell house on you, but the idea of this passage is this, that there were... In Paul's life, there was the concept of, of an ever-present demon, if you will, that reminded him of his issue with wanting to be strong in and of himself. But there's weakness that's there. And Paul has to keep alluding to the weakness because he, he trusts the Lord in this, and he trusts that God is going to show himself to be strong in the face of his weakness. If you've got questions about that, feel free to email me because that wasn't part of the sermon. To harass me, to keep me from being conceited. Verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. I don't want this anymore. Anybody been there? Don't want it. Leave me alone. And here's what God says to him. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. God lets Paul know. Jesus, when he interacts with him, says to Paul, hey, my grace is enough. Because it's when you know and you acknowledge that you're weak that, that, that it's actually my power showing through and shining through. There's a story, I don't know, Hope and I had terrible dates to movies when we were first dating. I took her to see the third in the Silence of the Lambs trilogy on Valentine's Day. I'll never live that down. Let's just be real. I got her. She put a ring on it. <laughs> so, we went to see the 300. If you don't remember the 300, or the movie Gladiator, you have these warriors, these Roman soldiers, 18-pack abs, which is not fair. In that day, those Roman soldiers, whether it be Maximus or the guy who led the 300, I don't even remember his name, Gerard Butler. Butler Iximus. 
the <laughs> if you were a general or an emperor of Rome, there was a slave who was assigned to you. And when you would come back from a victorious battle and, and you would walk down the center of the street with people on your left and your right clapping for you, applauding you, calling you God, here was the slave's one occupation. He was to whisper to you over and over, you are but a man. In this passage, as we talk about the strength of God, we can see this idea of Paul being harassed. And it is to remind him that Paul in your own strength For every one of us, we lose sight of where our real strength comes from. I pray that there are people for you, and there are opportunities for you, and there are things that happen to you that whisper into your ear, you are but a mortal. You are weak outside of the strength of Jesus Christ. Do we have that? Are those things there? Paul began to talk about his strength In the light of the super apostle, for the sake of Christ, then, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. We're still not risen from those things. I'm content. For men, and, and I would imagine it's, it's, I think it's more prevalent for men, but I'm by no means a psychologist. There is part of us that wants to always show how strong we are. I mean, I'm a member of Planet Fitness. I sit down on the curl machine. I roll up 65 pounds with both hands. I walk around. I could strut sitting down after I do that. I think that's present for lots of us. And ladies, I think it's present for us too. That we want to say we've got it together, we've got it together, we've got it together. When this passage and numerous passages over and over tell us, hey, you don't. You don't. No, no matter how much you want to fix things, no matter how much you, you make things perfect, no matter how much you Lego your life together, you don't have things together. You are weak, and we are to be reminded that there is beauty in weakness because it is in the moments where we display ourselves to be weak that God shows himself to be strong. He is a strong God. Here's what he says in verse 10. At the end of Paul saying, For the sake of Christ, I'm content to be weak. I'm content to be insulted. I'm content for hardships. I'm content with persecution. I'm content with calamities. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. So in the face of all of these super apostles who are saying they're strong in and of themselves, as a matter of fact, that's untrue. When I am at my weakest, it's when I'm at my strongest. Because God wants to display himself in our weakness. This isn't a new Bible concept. It's all over. In our strength, we get ahead of ourselves and we think that we're more important than we are. This is not a new thing. Anybody been there? When we look into the Bible and even the Old Testament pictures of how God chooses people and how God loves and how God declares as king, we see that. God's not looking for, for the outside appearance. He's not looking for those who would display themselves to be strong. As a matter of fact, God is looking to show himself to those who are the weakest. So Samuel sent to find a king. When he goes to find the king, he's sent to the house of Jesse because Saul is a clown. And Saul needs to be unking. Checkmate. So you see Saul in this path, or you see Samuel go to Jesse's house. He begins to look at the sons of Jesse and he goes down the line. And the oldest one's the strongest. And he says, that, that's got to be the new king. And God whispers to him, nope. He goes to the second one who's a little bit younger and he's still stout, country strong boys, farm kids. No. They go down the line. They go down the line. They go down the line. 
none of them are there. The king's not there. Samuel's perplexed. He's confused. He, he looks at Jesse and says, Hey, um, what happened to that other? Is there somebody else? He says, There's David, our youngest. And he can't be the guy. Why would we say he can't be the guy? Now, when we hear the word shepherd, usually our good shepherd and do a lot. We are excited about that. We should be. But there's a beauty in shepherding that we don't realize sometimes. The shepherd, the job of shepherd, was given not to the strongest. It was given to the kid who they couldn't find anything else for him to do. The runt of the litter. If we lose one, might as well be David with these seven strong lads we have here. That's the job they give to the person who can't figure things out on their own. That's what David and that's the beauty of Jesus coming to us as our good shepherd. That he meets us at our lowest place. But that's the one you see him meet you in his weakness. That's not the only place you see him. You see that? Moses stuttered and killed a man. And God says, in your weakness, I'm going to show myself to be strong. Read through your Bible a few pages. Keep telling you that this is completely in the face. I've always hated, and I will use that word again, hated when I would be with a group of students and, or a church and someone would say, that kid could be just could be such a good leader if they would just open their eyes. And I would say, yeah, they sure could. Because they're pointing at the football kid. Or they're, they're pointing at the, the best looking kid. If that kid, look how strong they are in and of themselves. They could lead so well. We feed this garbage to people all the time and it never stops being fed to us. You're not used by God because of your own strength. You're used by God because He's loved you and He's shown Himself to be strong. Now that may be the football kid, it may be the best looking person, it may be the wealthiest person, but it can also be that person, that widow with the mind. Can God use in here in his strength? Any of you. What does it mean to be weak? Really, what are we saying when we would say, in my weakness, I'm strong? We're saying, God, I, I need you. Please don't let me forget that I need you. I don't want to stop needing you. For our church to accomplish the mission that God has laid out for us to make disciples of all nations. There has to be a place for us where we quit reveling in our strength. We've got lots of things that the people would look at from an outside perspective and say are fantastic about our spot. Nice facilities, multiple camps, 60 acres. God's great concern is not to show himself through the acreage we have. It's to display his strength through a weak people. You say, God, I, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. For you're my one defense. You're my righteousness. But I've got no strength apart from you. So my prayer for us is that we'll hold one another accountable for that. One of the things that we're going through what takes place in Encounter, also with our sanctuary service, we want to offer small group opportunities for our church. And that's not just for the sake of you sitting around together and having warm fuzzies. That's not my deal. But what I do want us to consider is this, that you would become part of a group here at Ridgedale that we're going to do in home so that when we can process things together, so that we can acknowledge things together, so that we can wrestle with things together. And honestly, as we meet together, I hope these home groups do this. I want to give us directive in regards for us accomplishing mission together in our city, in our community. We don't do that in our own strength. We do that because God is strong and because He is our strength. And we realize that there is weakness in us that He wants to make much of Himself through. So let's live in the lowest level of that.
and, and here's the thing, and I heard a pastor say this the other day, and it's just so true. Lots of us, when we hear they, the, the phrase need Jesus, we immediately go to the people in the room who are not Christians. And I don't know, maybe you're not a Christian. And that's true. You need Jesus. But for you guys who are believers forever, you've had this under control forever, let me say, you never stop needing Jesus. To accomplish what God has set out for you to accomplish, for your weakness to be shown as strong, you need to live in the daily acknowledgement that you need Jesus. Because your strength's not in you, your strength's in Him. So let's be strong because of Him. You need Jesus. Let's not quit thinking about that. So at the end of our service today, John's going to share with us about small groups, about mission groups for us. And I want you to plug in you're interested in that, it may not be in the next few weeks. We've got one group that we're looking at starting, but if you want to plug into something like that, this isn't another thing for you to do. Don't do it as a chore. It's an opportunity for you to walk together in acknowledgement of our need to see people go. So, you can email me if you're interested. You can sign up on a sheet of paper somewhere, right on the bathroom wall. Whatever you want to do, I'd love to hear from you because I want us to be a people who live like we need. But I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to pray that this lands well for us today. God, you're good. And, Lord, in this room I have people that I love, that I really love. And I thank you for their faces and their families. I, I, I thank you for everything about them. I thank you for their struggles, and I pray that your strength is declared as strong in their weakness. Show yourself to be a great God in our weakness, Lord. So as we sing this song, Lord, as we hear the words of this song, I pray that we will wrestle in our heart. In your name, we pray these things. Listen, if you're here and you need me, I'm, I'm, I'm here at the front of the room. Some of you have asked me about joining our church. I'd love to talk to you about that, about being part of our fellowship here. At Ridgedale. Others, if, if you want to talk about what it means to place your trust in Jesus, what it means for you to grasp the strength that God offers, I'd love for that to be a conversation that we have. We are a people who live in need of Jesus. He is a great God and we are in great need. We never need a flip vote. God doesn't need you, you need Jesus. So please, just come, come share with me, come talk to me. Join the Join Ayana and Jonathan as they sing. As the Lord leads you to do so.